Here we are at episode 6, and boy, what a bloated mess this is. It's like Peter Griffin with a shellfish allergy. We're going to bounce around Arda like a pinball, so I hope you worked out your neck like Mike Tyson, because you'll get whiplash with everywhere we travel. Let's begin in Rune, where the stranger has a vision of Nori and Poppy in danger. This gets Poe and not Gandalf on their feet to get not Gandalf to undergo his last trial, as he's failed all the rest. What other trials? He hasn't done a damn thing since he got here. Your tree almost ate him, and he took a bath. What else has he done? Not going to show us? Figured. And I just have to stop here for a moment. I already don't like Vocal Fry all that much, but giving Tom Bombadil such a thing makes me want to root for Sauron. Have a listen. The secret fire whispers to us, if we have ears to hear. No normal tone whatsoever, he speaks and sings in the same tone with no flair, and I think I'd rather get into a breath-holding contest with the universe than endure him as a teacher. Anyway, we catch up with Nori asking the seven Afrode Stor why they don't just up and leave. CeeLo then explains this smeal is where she grew up and where she'll die. So in response, Nori considers turning herself into the Dark Wizard to save everyone. That's a wild leap in logic. Has the glue on that terrible wig soaked into your smooth brain? Submitting to him would in no way guarantee anyone's safety, you moron. Then Poopy and Discount Rufio kiss, because relationships are forced upon characters faster than arranged marriages. Then Snorri and Chubby then talk about giving up before deciding that's not a good idea, and I'm left wondering why even bring up the drama if you're just going to quash it literally the next scene. Anyway, Bombadil and Totally Not Gandalf wander into the wilds, where where Bombadil points actually Gandalf towards a dead valley of trees and basically says, your staff is in there. Good luck. Then Discount Gandalf says that he must hurry, because if he doesn't, Nori could die. And I shit you not, this is what Tom Bombadil says. Many that die deserve life, some that live deserve death. Who are you to give it to them? That's not at fucking all what Gandalf implied, you sophist. He wants to save his friends. He has a reason to fight that's more heroic than Discount Sauron's own drive for power. What the fuck are you talking about? There's more to this line that I'll discuss later because it's part of this approach to Bombadil as a whole. So, moving on, when Gandalf says he could re still return to his training, Socrates here follows up with this. You cannot. There are times when one path becomes two, and you must choose. Well, strap me down and torture me for a few centuries, Daddy Morgoth, because I guess I'm goose-stepping for Sauron now. What the hell is this ultimatum? This is the problem with retards in Hollywood who think they can write. Downgrading Bombadil from basically a stand-in for the Roman deity Sylvanas to a first-time voter who's had his head up his ass for the last four years proves he was written by someone who takes his Starbucks coffee with seven pumps of silicone. All Gandalf needed to do was flip the question around on Bombadil and watch him short-circuit like a producer that's angry at white men for not watching the movie they said wasn't for them. And I'll get to Bombadil later, again, because there is a lot to discuss about him and we have so much more to get through. Anyway, Gandalf says he can return to continue his training later. You know, the training he hasn't done at all. And Sophocles says, Turn away now, and you can never return to this path. Later. Later, I'll get to it later. So after this absolute troglodyte gives Gandalf the worst possible choice, he teleports away, leaving him alone. With Rune out of the way, let's launch all the way over to Khazad Doom, where the dwarves are apparently mining up gold coins and trinkets. Durin the Fourth was called to his father's chambers at the request of Anatar. He's here requesting more Mithril to complete the Rings of Power before Eregion comes under attack. So why was Dimwit the Fourth summoned? Then, to the surprise of his company, King Durin refuses the request. Taking it back by this, Wigron here looks into a torch and envisions the Balrog. Why? He shouldn't even know it's down here. Whatever, he acknowledges the refusal and is escorted out. Then the king explains that since war is coming, he intends to make like a true warhawk and uses it to make a profit. At this point, Dimwit begs the aging John McCain to prove himself and remove the ring. His father decides to keep the ring on, and when Dimwit tries to remove it, he's backhanded so hard it makes his ancestors dizzy. Back at home, Princess I'm Always Right says they need to lay down in front of the mine if necessary to stop the dig. You know, because trying to 
to stop people on a highway is also an effective way to piss everyone off. Then Dimwit the Retarded changes characters again, from taking a stand against his father, to why do you speak about him like that? Are we kidding? After you had two kids, you put your balls on the mantle above the fire, didn't you? If you did, you'd have to point them out, because they must be getting lost among the dust. So he whines about his father being humiliated, and then Disa says this. Only knows he's twice the father to me my own ever was. <laughs> they did it! Amazon fucking did it! They used the black father sucks trope. Oh my goodness, this is the funniest episode of a series I've ever seen! <laughs> oh, oh, I got lightheaded. Where were we? Oh yeah, he left for milk. So, Princess Does Nothing Wrong continues with the King is Nuts spiel, and Dimwit decides to start crying. Real inspirational there, Amazon. The Prince crying in front of his wife because his dad has a hard-on for gold. A little later, the two then stand in front of the tunnel of the mine, and then when Narvi and his men arrive, she turns around with a dramatic flare because her favorite video game character is Ganondorf. And is anyone supposed to be threatened by her? I mean, she's the planet in Planet Fitness. Whatever. Narvi then orders the guys to remove Princess Highway Blocker, and I wish I was this funny, because she does... <laughs> she does this. <laughs> Why? Why do people even have gym memberships? Just watch Rings of Power an episode a day, three times a week, and you'll have that summer bod in no time. Narvi shares my view of mockery that her bad singing was meant to scare him, but Princess Poison Flying Type summoned a colony of Zubats to scare off the dwarves. Are we fucking kidding? Dwarves would laugh these things off while Bruce Wayne sucks his thumb in the corner, and we're supposed to believe this works? Of course it does, because dwarves are now officially classified as invertebrates on account they all lack spines. Oh. God, anyway, so now let's cross over the Great Sea to Numenor, where Elendil stands trial. Our Farazan sentences Elendil to death, unless he renounces his crimes and pledges allegiance to Farazan. He renounces his crimes, but does not acknowledge Karl Marx as his leader. He's taken away after stepping forward menacingly and scolds his son, even though he did exactly what his father told him to do. <laughs> then Marx's subordinate suggests an execution by test of the Valar. Basically, Father of the Year is to be tossed into the ocean where a Gyarados will decide whether or not to eat him. If not, then hooray, he's innocent. But if it does, well, then hopefully it at least gained a level by eating him like a rare candy. The next morning, Yarin tries convincing her father to bend the knee so that he doesn't have to go through the trial. He refuses, of course, because she's too stupid to see the long-term problems of what's going on. And as so many in Numenor agree with Karl Marx, I'd have to assume chess is not a thing on this island. Anyway, Yarin's pleas fail and she decides to activate her ultimate card. Queen Muriel, who then commands Elendil to bend the knee, and his response couldn't possibly have been written by these writers. Here's what he says. Faith is not faith if it is not lived. That's a damn good line, and when Muriel presses him, he stands by his beliefs, saying, Were I to do so, I would cease to be the man you wish to save. What if you're wrong? Then I would rather die with a heart that is whole than live with one broken by cowardice. The writing of the series has been so consistently atrocious, there is no way that line could possibly have been written by anything other than AI, or an actually good writer. Lest I be made to believe these lines are a bigger fluke than Todd Phillips' success with Joker. So, they have a moment, and Father of the Year is brought to the trial of the Abyss. And can I say how much I just despise the Numenorian armor? This is supposed to be Numenor, the peerless pearl of the sea and peak of men's strength and resolve in Arda. And all their armor looks like the body mold was Bill Gates. Really harkens back to what I said years ago about the skill level of those who work in Hollywood nowadays, when the billion dollar series has armor that looks like it was forged with estrogen, when the men of Gondor at the end of the Third Age and on the brink of annihilation in the Two Towers looked like this. Anyway, so Father of the Year is about to take a dip when Queen Ray Charles appears. Again without an escort. She then uses her right to take Elendil's place in the trial. Karl Marx, being a true Marxist, has no idea she can do that because he's illiterate and doesn't know the law. Is this true? By the letter of the law, yes. 
So Muriel takes Elendil's place and is led into the pool where she pretends to tread water. The worm then pulls her out to sea and she doesn't immediately implode from the sudden extreme pressure difference. How did the worm even reach her? How far up the tunnel was the pool from the sea? How long are the tentacles? <sighs> Whatever, Gyarados deems her worthy and doesn't eat her, so she gets to come back like a clogged up toilet, having been proven innocent. Then Marx gets bent out of shape and goes up to his room to play with his balls, all while having flashes of Halbrand and his chiseled jawline, and presumably the ejaculation of Mount Doom. Now, before Eregion, let's catch up with Erendir, who has been jogging through the forest preserve ten miles from his home when he happens across some orc supremacists. You see, all they wanted to do was start families in gated communities, and to do this, he tries to citizens arrest the Fresh Prince of Noldor. He cartwheels away because Don Lemonless's favorite movie is apparently the world's strongest, and then, in the struggle, he shoots the orc dead instead of doing this in the first place. He then teleports away from the rock and kills the other two. Looting the two bodies, the Fresh Prince finds nothing but gray items, though he happens to find, of all things, a map. Specifically, of Eregion. And it's marked where the orcs are even gonna attack from. Yeah, real great job that a border in chief here killed Dorka the Explorer. Now, let's jump to Eregion, where the majority of this episode is set. In his forge, Celebrimbor is pissed off that he can't figure out how to forge new rings for men, and chastises what looks like a bent domino chip. He demands a new mixture, but Murdania explains they're out of mithril because the dwarves' last shipment hasn't arrived. Then she mentions her and the other smiths noticed his shortened temper and his turnaround just makes me chuckle. His posture oozes, and I took that personally, when he turns around and I can imagine him thinking, excuse the fuck out of you. <laughs> anyway, he then asks Murdania what her name is, because apparently he's becoming senile in his old age. You know, like elves do. Anatar then steps in and tells the smiths to take a break, just as Papa Brimbor sits down and happens to remember Murdania's name. Then he vents about forgetting even the littlest things, like a mechanic who can never find the 10mm socket of legend, even mentioning he forgot where his creasing hammer went, when the Kendall points out the hammer is right there. Except it wasn't, because they fucked up the edit. This is the actual sequence. Celebrimbor sits down and the hammer is there. In the wide shot, it disappears. And then in the other close-up, it reappears. I, I have to wonder if the editors were the ones who cut all this together or not. It's like the Game of Thrones Starbucks cup all over again. Anyway, old Brimbor mentions he's exhausted and Sauron informs him his people are demanding a hearing. Of course, Celebrimbor's priorities are at the whims of the writers, so he tells Anatar that the rings are more important than the entirety of the city. Do you have a council to govern in your stead? Will you request someone else lead your people while your head is up your own ass? No? Weird, it's almost like this was intentionally left open for someone else to come in and usurp control. Hey, what do you know, Sauron is the one who tells everybody that he's the Avatar and everyone else has to deal with it. And his first order of business is deciding what to do with the body of a dead elf. Captain Coppertone here mentioned that trade to the city was halted, so he sent some guards out to check and only one of them returned. This guy washed ashore a few moments ago. Why imply that he returned under his own power when he was obviously sent? Guys, you aren't smart when you write this way. Stop with the bullshit pronouns and talk straight already. Also, why was this dude's corpse brought into the city? He's in plain view of everyone at the base of the tower and could spark panic knowing there's someone or something killing everyone just outside the city. Why haven't actions been taken in accordance to these events? Why are the guards not covering the walls? Are there no scouts to check beyond the river? Why is it, again, that elves have worse eyesight than old man Jenkins? Hey, writers, show me on this doll where critical thought touched you. Anyway, Anatar decides to flex his leadership muscles and orders the elf to be buried, and no one questions this. Nor does he follow it up with any orders to secure the forest just across the river. We're supposed to believe this idiot who'd lose in a Connect Four tournament is in charge? Lord, give me strength. So Blondie here actually asks about Cuckabrimbor, and Wigron mentions that he stripped the smiths of their duties and that he's to be left alone at all costs. Instead of wondering why, she then asks what the message carved in the elf says, and he replies, 
where is he? Before Sauron steps up to the wall to peer over the horizon and spots multiple plumes of smoke. But obviously no one in the city could spot this because uh, clearly elves have 50-50 vision. Now as this goes hand in hand, we'll step just across the river to Adar's camp where Galadriel is captive. In Adar's tent, the two sit at a table where meat's back on the menu. Apparently, Gordon Ramsay traveled to Middle-earth on the Mayflower because he's got a pilgrim's feast laid out for these two and literally no one else. So much for showing love to your children. Anyway, Adar tries to convince Galadriel to work with him. A temporary alliance, if you will, to find and destroy Sauron once and for all. To convince her, he pulls out Morgoth's crown. Ah yes, the crown that didn't kill Sauron. Galadriel recoils in dread of the helmet she recognizes before Adar mentions the crown was reforged to fit Sauron. Hold the fuck on. If the crown was reforged, how would Galadriel know what it looks like? What was the budget spent on that that the prop department only had enough to make one version of Morgoth's own crown? Anyway, Adar mentions he used the crown to kill Sauron, and justifiably, Galadriel asks the question we all had way back at the beginning 20 minutes of this season's first episode episode. If it didn't work then, why would it work now? And his response? Because I had not found you. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? Are we seriously shipping another pair of characters? Adar then asks about the Three Rings preventing her people from fading. How would you know this? You've had no contact with anyone who has knowledge of the Rings until now, and there is no way anyone your forces may have slain at this point would have known about them either. And how would inquiries about the Rings even come up in that context? Whatever, Adar believes when combined, the Crown and Rings would be powerful enough to destroy Sauron. Huh? How are you drawing these conclusions? What's the intent? You're gonna smelt them into a single weapon? Weapon or combine them to summon Captain Planet. Damn it. Anyway, he knows Sauron is in a region. And I, 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 I hate stopping myself like this, but how do you know he's in the city? Where was your scout this entire time? Was Sauron not knowledgeable? Did he not sense the orc this entire time? Am I supposed to believe between episodes one and three that one or more orcs tracked Sauron all the way from Mordor to the Shire, then to a region, and return to Mordor, and no one noticed them. It's not impossible, I suppose, but again, where were they? Ah, uh, what the fuck ever. Adar then confirms Sauron's identity and shackles Galadriel to the chair with these handy-dandy magnetic clasps that do not lock at all. What, did you think we wouldn't notice, Amazon? Now, do you think that Galadriel will girl boss her way out of her predicament? Or refuse to converse with Adar any further as he cannot be trusted? Well, you're wrong, because Galadriel goes through yet another major character swap by spilling the beans about Sauron being Halbrand, why he's in Eregion, and what his goals are. Real steadfast resolve you got there. Anyway, she keeps digging herself a deeper hole, explaining Elrond will return with an army from Linden, and when he does, they can work together to save Eregion and destroy Sauron. Adar asks what will happen to his orcs, seeing as they've murdered and pillaged their way across Middle-earth, and elves and orcs mix about as well as bathwater and toasters. Dumladriel doesn't have an answer when he presses her that his people will be wiped out, and he thanks her for giving him all the information he could want and more. He thinks she'll be tricked by Sauron anyway, and shows his favorite movie as the Two Towers by revealing an enormous army of orcs. And he plans on wiping out the city, knowing that basically no one stands in his way. Then why did you ask if your people would be pardoned? Raising a Region would guarantee your people be hunted down and exterminated from Arda. There is not a character in this show who is not flip-flopped more than a skateboarder tumbling down a flight of stairs. Anyway, Dom Astriel believes this must be a part of Sauron's plan to use them to destroy a Region and is imprisoned once more. Then Glug is hesitant to hand over the horn because he's obviously being set up to betray Adar and the orcs begin their attack on a Region. The elves on the tower and in the city, who only now notice something is wrong, immediately panic like it's a Black Friday sale, tripping over each other as the siege begins. Seeing shit about to hit the fan, Sauron cuts his hand, then heads up to Kuka Brimbor's tower, where he's working on new designs when he hears the siege alarms. Just as he's about to open the doors, the Kendal appears and blocks his every attempt, revealing his favorite cartoon is Avatar The Last Airbender, when he basically says, trust me, bro.
bro, everything's fine, there is no war in Ba Sing Se. Celebrimbor then shoves him against a wall because he's done being told what to do. There we go! Now he's beginning to act like the Celebrimbor of the novel. Then Sauron works up some magic, and just as Celebrimbor opens the door, he walks into a bright and shining Eregion without any issues, and it's daytime. Anatar then convinces Celebrimbor that everything is fine, and this works because Celebrimbor's intelligence stat became a negative 10 for this scene to work. He knows it's night and was working by candlelight. He heard the siege alarms and people screaming, hence why he came to check things out. Anatar tried to keep him locked in his room and acted out against him, and for no good reason, his intelligence drops below Kamala Harris's so he can continue to be locked in his tower like Rapunzel so he can work on the fucking rings. Why aren't you asking anyone about what you heard? Oh, but we're supposed to ignore this because a decent in-camera transition happens? The light changes and the siege begins? Really? That's it? God, fuck you. Anyway, now that all that's done, I want to go over the one thing I wanted to discuss, which is Tom Bombadil. I despise what Amazon's done with him. He's like a bad video game mechanic. Mechanically, he has no reason to hold back, and thematically, he's an absolute bastardization of his novel self. As I've mentioned before, he's indifferent to the plights of mortals and immortals alike, to the degree that Gandalf said that he'd sooner forget he even had the One Ring in the first place. Tom saved the hobbits, gave them shelter, and then barrow blades, which were key to the defeat of the Witch King of Angmar. So, novel Bombadil works incredibly well. Here's how Rings of Power fucked him up. First, the mechanical issues. If Bombadil is truly as powerful Powerful as he is, then the Dark Wizard should be no problem to defeat. So his concerns for the future of Arda make no sense when he could easily solve the problem himself and train a new student. Worse yet, thematically, turning him into another being concerned with the world dissolves him of all mystery and theme. This version of the character is the personification of smooth brain takes. A lot of people tend to complain about Tom Bombadil online because why didn't he just get involved? He could have solved the problems. You know, questions that the book actually answers, but again, we aren't dealing with fans. These are tourists. There are two great examples to bolster this argument, the Night King, and Yoda. Let's start with the plagiarism. The Night King is not just a blatant ripoff of the Lich King from Warcraft, whose armor in turn was inspired by Sauron's. He is death incarnate. No matter how hard you fight, how fast you run, or where you hide, death comes for us all. His inevitability rendered the Game of Thrones irrelevant as the short-sighted vie for power that it is, blinding us to the importance of the world around us and who we should be fighting for. Bombadil relates to and was played plagiarized for this theme, since George Martin is a fucking hack, as Gandalf states, quote, No, I should not put it so. Say rather that the ring has no power over him. He is his own master, but he cannot alter the ring itself, nor break its power over others. Rings of Power alludes to this, but butchers everything by making him involved. He's no longer a higher aspiration, now he's a cowardly mentor who wants others to do the work for him. This is where the Yoda comparison comes in. As with the Night King, Amazon's Bombadil is a two-bit knockoff that misunderstands what it rips off. The setting is similar. Dire times, a faded meeting, and an evil former student. The issue is the execution, where Yoda is at the end of his days testing Luke from the moment they first meet, teaching Luke all he can before he dies. Bombadil doesn't teach Gandalf a damned thing, and when his friends are in danger, Tom says all purchases are final and leaves. Yoda's clock was ticking, and these people were experienced warriors, and through the Force he could recognize this, and while in the end he knew Luke was on the the right path, Bombadil has all the time in the world but chooses to force Gandalf to make a choice. And this is where the quote from earlier comes in. This is Gandalf's quote, and a butchered one at that. The full quote, in context, is about the possibility of redemption for Gollum because Gandalf wasn't sure what role he had to play in the fate of the One Ring. Quote, Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment, for even the very wise cannot see all ends. I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it, and he is bound up with the fate of the ring. My heart tells me that he has some part to play yet, for good or ill, before the end, and when that comes, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many, yours not least. 
least. Omitting everything beyond the first three sentences strips the paragraph of all hope and redemption, and its use in the show twists the context into a spiteful ultimatum of sacrifice at the cost of others, which is the antithesis of what was said. And that says it all. Rings of Power is the antithesis of Lord of the Rings. It is not the visualization of a beloved story. It's a stripped-down radical corruption that's been acid-washed to the point of being unrecognizable. The characters, their actions, choices, prerogatives, the world, its lore, history, and events, everything has been radically transformed. Ultra-processed into something that tries to resemble what we enjoy, but when you bite into it is nothing like we know it used to be. It's just trash on a plate with no soul or passion behind it, and it's a shame that this is what Tolkien's works have become. Now strap in, we got two more episodes and this battle spans both. And believe me, it's gonna get worse.